Okay, good afternoon, guys. Welcome to the show. As you know, this BTN Club in Conversation series is about the music legends that have given us so much pleasure over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. <laughs> Not that I'm old enough, but you know, this is stories that I've heard. <laughs> we have Grammy Award winning Junior Giscom. Hey, how you doing, Barry? He's made time for me today. Let me tell you, he squeezed me, squashed me in. <laughs> you know, so I'm very honored to have this Grammy Award winning legend here. And, oh. you know, UK talent as well. As you can see, my dog, my husky walking in the background. Yeah, there. I can <laughs> see. <laughs> He's like, Good. this is my house, okay? So I don't <laughs> care about your interview. I'm going to walk where I want, okay? So we'll Too just right. have to look over that. But um, yes, great to have you. And I always say, I mean, I've interviewed you a few times now, but I've interviewed you a few times because you're ever evolving. Thank you're like you Diane Ross. You, you are constantly evolving and coming up with something new. Because the last <laughs> time we spoke, you, you had a new single out, Change Gonna Come. That's right. It was a favorite, yeah, you know. Um, so you Thank came you. to the radio station and we were promoting that. So, you know, we had great success. Was that day? Huh? Do you remember that day? I remember that day very well. We <laughs> the, had, the, the, the whole drama on the way yes, there. We had a bit of drama <laughs> on that day. Yeah. And again, you know, that's why I interview Junior any opportunity I can get because it's always eventful. It's always exciting. You never know what's going to happen. It's never going <laughs> to just be, you know, Junior just sitting in the camera ready and waiting. It's always like, let's go. Wait a minute. I'm on my way. <laughs> right? So it's always eventful. But as I said, you're ever evolving and that's one of the secrets of people sustaining a great career in this industry. You've constantly got to be metamorphosizing. But let's briefly go back to the beginning for okay. you. Where did the music start for you? I think the music started at home, really for right. me. It was, it was um, I'm the youngest of eight. So right. I had a sister who was living in America. She used to send over a lot of early American stuff, like say for um, Sam Cooke, um, James Brown, that kind of stuff. And my older brothers were into reggae as well. My sisters were into reggae and soul. My mom was into um, gospel. My dad was into jazz. I'm listening to the radio, so I'm getting pop music all the time. Right, so yeah. it was a melting pot in the house of music. A complete and utter eclectic mix of music, which I Very think- Very much so makes your appreciation of music even better because mm -hmm. you can appreciate jazz, you can appreciate pop. And all those who pretend that, you know, especially being in the UK mm -hmm. in a certain era, the only outlet of music you really had officially was the radio, Radio One. Capital radio One. Radio, and, you know, hanging out the window, listening to Radio Luxembourg on a <laughs> Friday. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so... True. You know, that was it. So, you know, we, we had that whole eclectic pop thing. And those who tried to deny it, I'm saying, forget it. You, that's yeah. all you had once you grew up here. But Agreed. it's great to have you here because, again, you're one of the UK talents. I've mm -hmm. been very blessed and honored to have a lot of the UK, um, US legends talk mm -hmm. to me about their career, you know, from Tom Brown, Linda Clifford. It's been yeah. amazing. But it's actually nice to have a UK based artist Thank you. Um, who has you know reached the echelons <laughs> up there so it's it's nice to talk to you but as you said it started with the family which I think is usually the story with people you know yeah. older brothers and sound yeah. system and etc etc the whole thing the whole thing yeah. I, I played sound system in terms of I had a friend and we when I was about 13 14 and we used to go down to the roaring 20s down in Carnaby Street then times um, so Coxon would be playing down there, right? Wow, and then he was, Coxon playing in Carnaby Street. Yeah, really? in Carnaby yeah. Street, a little club called the Roaring Twenties. Wow. And we used to go down there and they'd allow us, we were kids, but Dudley, was, his sister was going out with Lady Coxon. So he'd allowed us to play yeah, for yeah. Us. from 11 till 12, we could play. And then Festus and Junior would come on and play. So... My whole beginnings in music wasn't just, as you say, it wasn't just one style of music. 
Yeah. When I started to make music, everybody started, lots of bands in the UK were doing jazz funk. You had, you know, your central lines, your high tension, uh, your incognitos, you know, which was back then bigger and co- all of that kind of stuff. It was yeah. all trying to mix the jazz that they were hearing coming in from America with the funk. And yeah. so they were all doing that kind of style in a different way to each other, but it was the same kind of thing. Right. And I wanted something different. I wanted to come a bit more, to be honest, I wanted to come a bit more edgier, a bit more rockier, a bit more urgent and with a different and kind. And you certainly of did that because, I mean, your first single, which was the biggest, you know, <laughs> Mama used to say, mm-hmm. everybody was like, but this sounds like a rock and roll tune. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, because everybody's ready now with the, okay, it's you know, you do not quite that. It's, <laughs> it's a bit poppy, rocky. I'm not sure about this. Right. You know? right. It was something, it was me, the beginnings of me understanding me, if you could understand. You know, what I'm saying is, is that like at that time, I knew that I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing. I didn't want to become a part of something. I wanted to be the main frame in terms of this something that I was yeah, going to do. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's down to your character, your personality, more of an innovator, a leader, a creator of something, not necessarily new, but something slightly different from different. the norm. Exactly. It was yeah. so... I think when when I put a band together, and uh, we were called Atlantis, and the bass player, George Anderson, who... I'm sure you know, he's made a couple of albums now on his yeah. by himself. Used to be with Shack Attack, still is with Shack yeah, Attack. Yeah, yeah. And uh, George was a part of the band. So when he came down, right, he was playing finger bass. And I just bought Sly Stone's album, right? There's a riot going. And I heard this guy banging bass and it just seemed urgent, which is Larry Graham. It just seemed right. so right? Larry Graham, I mean, come on. Just come on, right? The ultimate. Larry Graham. So I, I gave George, he came down the Sunday to rehearsals and I said, we're not rehearsing today. Take home this album and learn this stuff. Learn to bang, because that's the urgency I want. I want that energy. Right. So George went off, did his thing. Um, because I'd heard as well, I think it was not, I'm going back now, 73. The Isley Brothers came out with an album. Just to be clear, I was in primary school. Okay. Oh, Move okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to be clear. Okay. Move on. Didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> I'm a young teenager then. Come on. <laughs> but I, I got hold of this album, Three Plus Three, and that's what I wanted to do. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something that was funky, had soul, but yeah. at the same time had an edge. So... Obviously, you go back in the archives of that band and you realize that like Jimi Hendrix was the guitarist in the band. So when you hear yeah. Ernie Nicely, it's like listening to a young Jimi Hendrix. And I just loved it very. I just I just fell in love with it. So I put together a three piece band, three vocalists, and we went out and we started doing dates. And when we were doing the dates, it was like everybody was like, What the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like this rock come energy and we're, we're all over the place on stage and stuff. But I loved it. I, I found that that was it for me. But we yeah. went to Birmingham and while in Birmingham, we were playing a reggae gig, right? And we're playing this rock music, right? This R&B rock. I music. wish I was a fly on the wall to see these people's faces. <laughs> you should have, listen, I've never forgotten it. It was like, <laughs> but that changed the whole game for me because we did a 45 minute set Right. And all of the songs were original songs. There wasn't any songs. So I, I didn't want to do any covers. Covers. I wanted yeah. us to be an original band. So and at the time, I'm still listening to the meters. I'm listening to all of these bands, you know. Right. So we go and we play this 45 minutes set, Barry, and we come off stage. And when we come off stage, when we, sorry, when we finished, not one person clapped. Nobody clapped. Nobody said anything. I thought to myself, oh, my God. And we've got to walk through the crowd now to go I to the changing that room. That is almost soul-destroying, no? Listen, but hear the thing. <laughs> we, would walk through, we were walking through the crowd and a, a guy would touch you and say, you're bad, you know? And the next one would touch you and say, like, well, no good, you know? 
And the next one, <laughs> that's you. Know, it, it's like, you know, why well, go on with it, man? Go on with it. And she, you know, these are all dreads and everything. Yeah, but, what, but you know what? They're the ones that get it. Thank they're you. They're the ones that get it, but not courageous enough to be going, yeah! Exactly. the others who don't get it. Who <laughs> don't get it. And that was the thing for me. I realized that, like, I didn't, it, you don't, you just need to put across who you are, yeah. right? And, and make that the center of everything. Don't don't go with what is happening because it's happening and you feel that your music yeah, has to be I think that's, that's a mistake a lot of people make. Um, it's all about following people because mm. that's what's the popular thing at the moment. So make it sound like that. Make it look like that. Exactly. Rather than... Well, do what's comfortable with me. And me. Let the people who get it come. Get it. Yeah. 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 You know, so that was that was the big thing for me. But I must have been about 16, 17 at that time when that happened. And uh, it changed everything because yeah. what it did was it made me realize that like I have to stay in my lane. This is what you do, and this is what you do well. So when right. we came, Mama used to say. I remember the record company was listening to it and they're like, yeah, but this is, it's slightly rock. It's slightly R&B. Yeah, it's, I don't know really where to what place is it. This? <laughs> I don't know where to place it. Yeah. Right. And my thing was, was that like, just put it into the market. You, you're a major rate, major label, right? Promote it, put it into the market. So they put the record out. On the 27th of July, 1981. I remember it because it's my sister's birthday. Right. And the record died a death, Barry. Didn't do anything. But I've got a phone call. From, really? Yeah. It, when it first came out in England, it died a death. No DJ would play. Everybody was saying at the time that I'd, I'd get things like, who does he think he is? Right? You know, for making this music that had rock in it. You know, because again, at that time, the country, in terms of the DJs and stuff, as much as they liked to play black music, it was primarily run by white DJs and they were the soul mafia. And if they played your tune, then your tune would kick off. If they didn't play your tune, then you'd be on the sidelines. So record companies would give the soul mafia, the, the mafia, the, the, the songs or the records. If they didn't hear it, then the record company was like, ah, oh, well, it's not going to happen and this, that, and the other. They didn't even try in those days. So, uh, I went on tour with Lynx that, that winter and Lynx were the biggest band in the country at the time. And I joined Lynx and we went out on tour and it was again, another incredible experience to watch two, three, 4,000 people every night going absolutely crazy for Lynx music. Right. And again, Lynx were a band that didn't sound like anybody else. David and Sketch managed to have their own thing with your lying, you know, throw away the key, so this is romance. And were you were you in links at one stage on BVs? Or, or yeah. Something? Yeah, yeah, you were. Okay. Yes, yeah, I was. And um, I went out on tour with them as well. And when we when we were on the tour, the record company rang me up and said that they wanted to remix. Mama used to say, "Now nobody's ever done a remix before." So I'm asking, "What is a remix?" Yeah, so in, okay, I had yeah. to ask, what is that? You know, yeah. they said they told me that, like, you know, what we're doing is we'll take the, we're going to give this guy the masters. He's going to use the masters, right, and just mix the sound, change the sound of the record. So I was like, I'm up for this. Let's, you know, because I, I want to hear, I, I want to know. I'm, I'm still developing. Yeah, and again, you know, because as you said, the the first time you, you know, released it. It kind mm. of flopped. You're thinking, well, <laughs> this might give it some new energy. Well, this is what I thought. I've I just got nothing to lose. I've got nothing to lose. You know what I'm saying? I, I remember saying to my mum, you know, when it didn't happen, I was like, oh, gosh, I hope they just give me one more chance. Just one more chance. Let me make another record. I'm going to do it, mommy. I'm going to do it, you know. But fortunately, it was mixed by a guy called T. Scott. And T was working and was the DJ for... <laughs> another DJ in America called Frankie Crocker, who was on WBLS in New York. And, and Frankie Crocker, if Frankie Crocker played your record, that was it. It was all over. Your record's gone clear. So they did the remix. I heard the remix. I thought, this sounds great. Put out the record in America. And while we were on tour, I'd get these phone calls. You've done 100,000 in Chicago. 
You've done 150,000 in New York. You've done 100,000 down in Montana. You've done, and this was every day. And I couldn't get my head around the fact because it was, it wasn't like they're saying you sold 10 or you sold five. Yeah. <laughs> it's hundreds of thousands of records that they were selling at the time. And uh, when I went to America the following year, which was the 82, when I went to America and um, I did Soul Train, first black English guy to do Soul Train, right? There were things that were like first in my life that was going yeah. on. And again, all of these American artists who were so warm to me and were giving me advice and showing me what the industry was like and encouraging me and wanted to know, and when I met Stevie Wonder, he sat down and said, how did you make that record? You sound like a bad. And that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted it to yeah. sound a So bad. what we know as the single that of Mama used to say that topped the charts mm -hmm. is not the original mix. No. The original mix, and, and, and the thing is, in America, what was really mind-blowing was that Mama was the only tune I don't think anybody else has ever done it, that radio stations would play the English version for three minutes, three and a half minutes it was, and then they'd play the American mix, right, which would be the long, elongated mix. So I got nine minutes of radio time. Of airtime. Of airtime, right, yeah. across the board. And then when I would go to certain stations, they would turn around and say to me, why did you remix it? What's this remix? The original's the one. So when I came back to Britain and they decided now that they were going to put it out and everything, the same jocks who were saying that like, no, 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 it's too rock, it's too this and whatever. All of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, that tune's great. Oh, mate, it's fantastic, you know? And it was all because of the fact of the American audience going uh, for... And, and you know, and a lot of that went through British culture from fashion to... A lot of people had to go away to make it. And, you know, the very same product that they had in the UK, because you were from the UK, it was like, oh, well, maybe you had to go away to mm -hmm. States, to Canada, to other countries in Europe Great. and get that reception there and come back with the very same product. And then suddenly everyone's like, oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. It was fantastic. It yeah. was like, oh, my God, this is great, man. You know, so you, you again, as I said, that that rigged gig that I did was so important because it showed me that like you do you junior right you know regardless of whether or not people are saying to you oh I don't like it I'm, I'm not feeling this I'm not that yeah 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 there is an audience there you know it's been proven you know the and audience see, this is why I like to speak to this guy because so many inspirational things come out in what you say Mm -hmm. without you even realizing it and it is is such a you know tell people be yourself you're always going to get people saying who do you think you are who does he think he is he, who mm -hmm. does she think he? and you know in our culture it's always the think you're too nice you don't think worry too nice. about that yeah <laughs> you think you're too nice but you know don't worry about that exactly. be yourself and be you and do you the way you need to so thank yeah. you to that for that and thank you for reinforcing that with people that are watching because it really is important to be you and be comfortable with being you a lot of the time we don't we we forget ourselves for what we see or what we hear so yeah. if you're walking in a particular line all of a sudden you you somebody will start talking to you i don't really like that line you haven't done anything wrong but i just don't like that line and you start questioning yourself and then you may follow, and then your life becomes a following. You're led all the time. You're not using your own mind to yeah. be able to push yourself where you want to be. Some, yeah. you know, you're hoping that somebody else will come and pick you up, dust you off, and say, "Don't worry, Junior. I can do it for you, man. You know, we can do this. We can." And I'd never been that kind of character. I'd always, when we did the second single which was too late and we I was talking about alcoholism within the song and I'm talking about abuse you know women being abused yeah. by men in that way and uh I had to fight for four to six weeks to get that record out because of the fact that they didn't want um a black guy making that kind of record kind of subject matter 
too serious, exactly. too, too, um, it was too you deep know. for them. Yeah, it, it was much too deep for them, and they felt that like the audience wouldn't go for it because of the fact that I was the jovial junior in in, in the Mom first round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, and, you know, you were doing all the things that you, you're supposed to do, or what? That Jazz record. hands and smile and dance. Thank and you. That's like what we do. Like, yeah. You know what I'm saying, right? So. Yeah, you're not, not allowed, that. you're not permitted to be multifaceted and no. and have various opinions, you know, on, on, you're just supposed to dance and sing or do sport and smile. And that's yeah, it. Nothing so serious. You, nothing serious. So when Too Late came out, they didn't promote it here, but it went top wow. 10 in America. Went to, I think it was number five or number six in America. So what was happening was my career was becoming cemented in America yeah. and in England, it was more being dictated to. So again, it, it, we did the first album and we did that first album within six weeks because of the fact that everybody was playing on the album was on the, the Lynx tour. And we used to rehearse, after we, re we rehearsed the Lynx stuff, we would re rehearse the tracks that I'd written for the albums. Wow. When, when I came in, when I came off a tour, I was told you had six weeks to make this album. And we just went in and we just cut this album very and, and did everything, did the vocals one time, everything, one and two overdubs. And then we went into mix and everything. It was one of a glorious moment to be able to, to say that you, you were given a challenge and you, you rose to the challenge. Yeah. And uh, so that album came out and did what it did, which was very well. And, we went on to the second album, and when we got to the second album, I was facing the same kind of constrictions with, with the record company, which was, we want you to come up with something more down the Mama Used to Say road. My thing was, was that, like, that's, Mama Used to Say, that was that, was that. too late is what it was. I can't help it, it's yeah. what it was. I don't want to be making or writing in exact same structures just to continue to have hit records. The Almost people that, typecast. Yeah, you know, it was a, just change the just change the lyrics and then change right. a key here or there. Or but there. it's basically Mama used to say for the rest of your career. It's like exactly. an actor being put into that typecast role. You right. know, I played a gangster in 1965. Here I am in 1995, still playing a gangster. Still playing a gangster. Yeah, exactly. And I just didn't want to be that kind of artist. There were people out there who did it very well. But I wasn't like that. I, I wanted Again, to. That wasn't the next you, stage. and you had to do you. Yeah, I wanted to take it to the next stage. When we did the, the second album, Inside Looking Out, what I was saying with that was that I was now part of this industry and I'm looking out. When I was a kid, I was looking in. I wanted to be in. Yeah. Now that I was in, I couldn't wait to get out. Yeah, you know, because you were confined, restricted. Yeah. Everything yeah. was happening at that time. And, and you know, there was a lot of racism in music at that time as well. So that also made me get political in the sense that I was a part of something called Red Wedge, uh, an organization called Red Wedge, myself, Billy, Bra Billy Braggs and Paul Weller. And what that was really all about was to highlight, especially for me to highlight to black people that we should lobby our MPs. We should be forget central government because they're not going to hear you so those mps that like you know survive off of you lobby yeah. them let them know that you want change let them know that certain things within your area isn't correct and if they don't come along with your program then you're going to look somewhere else you're after the person who will actually do something will for action something and action change but you know again that's another string to your bow you're very much an activist as yeah. well as a musician. Yeah, I think that came, and that really came from the records and the music that I was hearing from people like Gil Scott, people like uh, Curtis Mayfield, people like the Lost Poets. They were all writing things, even Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, they were all writing things which was pertaining to their people, what was going on, how it was for them, what yeah. they were trying and to do. And you know, do. when you look at when these songs, because culturally, the US it was a very different place from oh, the UK. You know, much. when you look at these these songs that we all love now that were written in 60s, 70s, 
that was in the height of the civil rights struggle in the US, you know, and they were all political songs with messages, you know, what's going on, Marvin Gaye is about the Vietnam um, War and, and yeah. things like that. But, you know, they were all very political, not yeah. aggressive, but no. they're just saying, and educating a lot of people I was as gonna to say what's that. going on. I was going to say that, but a lot of it was about educating the people. A lot of it was about telling them about when people talk about Tuskegee right now and all, what was going on back then. Yeah, They were talking about it in the early 70s. In mid seventies, they were making you know that these things were going on. They were they were lyrically astute and were able to open your mind to. I remember listening. Yeah, to, you know, because again, as you say, it's educating people, and and yeah. some people they don't watch the news. Some people they don't read, you exactly. know, newspapers and stuff. But they'll they'll always pick up a record and play it, and they're hearing this message. Exactly, so, and it was yeah. that. A very important thing for me. It wasn't. It was um, me realizing uh, realizing who I was. I was realizing that I lived in England. I was realizing that England doesn't really run in the way that I thought it ran. I was realizing by getting more and more into the, the political end of things that there were unscrupulous people who didn't Absolutely. see anything other than the, the green and other than that money. So it would do unscrupulous things to get it, and that, that's not just within the music industry, but throughout life. So yeah. that period of, I would say my mid twenties going into my early thirties was incredibly interesting and, and invaluable. I, I couldn't be the person that I am today making music today if I didn't Without have, that learning process. Without that learning process and that journey. And, and as I said, there wasn't anybody in England who had broken America in that way. There was Billy Ocean who came through. Ruby Turner had a huge hit in America before me, but wasn't able to go over to follow it up. So right. when Junior came and Junior came into the whole thing and started following it up and you're getting people like Rick James coming and fixing your tire. And then you get like a Stevie Wonder got you in your car, got him in, I'm in his car and he's, he's turned on the engine and he's ready to drive the car. And I'm saying, what the hell are you doing, man? You know, you get... And the, you're the actually pinching yourself thinking, is this really is happening? This real? I'm I'm trying to be cool here. <laughs> like that, that, you. Was, that was Rick James that just fixed my tie there. But you know, Come on. I'm trying to be cool here, but I'm in the time you're going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's just> <laughs> it was a I lot of that. that. It was a lot of that. I I I had a, a song on the second album called Oh Louise that they put out in America, and again we had another hit. And Teddy Riley came over to England 10, 15 years later and was standing at Hammersmith Odeon. and he'd rung me up and said I should come to the gig. But unfortunately, I couldn't go to the gig. Right. So I'm in the studio and I get a phone call from a friend of mine who says to me, I've just gone and seen Teddy Riley right at Hammersmith. So I said, yeah, how was he? He said, Junior, Teddy Riley turned around and said that you started swing me. So I said, what? So he said, yeah, Teddy Riley turned around, he asked, he shouted out your name, right, and said, you know, this music that I'm making, right, Junior started this. I mean, Swing Beat's been around for years before me. I did with, with O Louise, that was Swing, and it was a Swing yeah. Beat. Vibe. He took that vibe, and what we all know for the 90s was that Swing Beat was the beat. Yeah, but yeah. it was really nice for him to turn around and say... And acknowledge they, the influence. And, and the influence. Yeah. And that, that, to me, was was really, really lovely. Just to know that, like, regardless of whether or not it was, you made a tune that he had to sit down and listen to and say, you know what, I can do yeah. this this way. And yeah. came with Guy. And when Guy came out, I'm a big fan. Do you get what I'm saying? Because I'm not of listening course. to... I'm not listening to it from the emphasis of me. I'm listening yeah, to that. You know, big fan without even really, well, I mean, I guess you knew because he told you, but really mm. and truly, when you're listening to it, you're not thinking, I was the one who influenced this. You're just <laughs> loving it for what it is. Exactly. No. You're just loving it for no. what it is. It but is I have to say, is. one of your understated tunes, which mm -hmm. has to be one of my favorites, is okay. Look What You've Done To Me. Done to I me. Don't understand how that <laughs> wasn't bigger. I don't understand. That same thing. It's huh? the same thing, Barry. Same thing. When 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 we did look what you've done to me, 
right? I gave it to the record company and I said, you know what? You need to put this out as a single. And I remember everybody in the room looking at me and just like smiling condescendingly. Oh yes, right, Junior, right. And I, I'm like, listen, this song, right, is going to help take me to another level, right? And they wouldn't have it very, they, they turned around, it's good enough, it's only good enough for the album. So I just yeah. thought, okay, yeah, it's only good enough for the album. So I thought, okay, hopefully people will get the chance to hear it. And if they hear it and they love it, then, you know, that's something that, again, you've been able to touch people with your music, Junior, in a different way. And that's wow. been the key. Yeah, they wouldn't put it out. They didn't hear it. They couldn't hear that song. And didn't even give it a chance because musically... No. For me, yeah, that is up there, even uh, dare I say it to the man himself. But more than Lou o. Louise, for me, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, yeah. that's just a personal thing. It's a personal yeah, yeah. thing. But look what you've done for me, lyrically, musically, for me, is very, very special. Very, thank very you special. very much, man. Thank you very much for that. You know, it's nice to. It's always nice to hear that the things that aren't the obvious which are the singles, uh, the things that people are into, the things that they that feel. The people appreciate them, even though yeah. they're not, you know, mainstream. mainstream. Which again goes back to you saying, you did that, it was something you felt and you loved. Mm -hmm. You were doing you. Yeah. Who gets it, gets it. Unfortunately, the people in power didn't get it. Right. And even give it a chance. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are people out there like myself who got it. So don't worry. Exactly. And I thank <laughs> you so much for that. <laughs> don't worry. And then the other one is Morning Will Come. That's another big hit for you, isn't it? Yeah, well, Morning Will Come, again, came at a time where um, I was looking to try. I, I, I'd grown. I'd grown up. And I knew that. I loved this, I love reggae and I love soul. And I wanted to be able to mix that. So I wanted to have a Caribbean kind of undertone to it coming from the reggae side of things. And I wanted to have a, an R&B feel to it, right? That would make people like myself who like that, that kind of style go out and say, yeah, I like this. I was, I, I was dealing with myself in dealing with the record. And wow. when we, when we did the tune, I went to LA. I did a video in LA, came back. And when I came back, um, my wife said to me, you need to go out. I said, what do you mean I need to go out? I've only just come back. She said, you need to go out, Junior. I'm gonna take you, we're gonna go down somewhere. And we, we jumped in the car. We went to this little club just over by, I think it was down, where is it, Beckenham, somewhere down there. And they put on Morning Will Come, Barry. And the place just went crazy. And I'll never forget it. I was standing at the back and it was like my hair stood up. And yeah, the, couldn't the believe. Goose the goose yes. Party. Yeah, you feel the, the chill. I, I felt that thing. And it was like I managed to do it. I, I managed to define another junior style in Morning Will Come and have reggae guys playing it, have soul guys playing it, have commercial guys playing it, right? And it was never a hit record. It was a street hit that's lasted for the last 20 odd years, 30 years, yeah, you know? So it's nearer 30. Than, yeah, nearer 30. It's nearer 30 years. than 20. Believe it. And people still play so when it. when did like, that come out? Was it 95 or something like that? Was it? Yeah, just around about that time. I think yeah. it was just, we did, the Red Wedge tour, so yeah, about 95, 96. Yeah. But it, it was incredible because it was like, I managed to to forge all of this, all of these influences, right, into one that defined, I remember my aunt who never liked mama used to say, like too late, didn't like this, didn't like that, rung me and said, the best tune you ever make is this tune you're about right now. Morning will come and the best tune, Junior. I was like, oh, I'm serious. Thank you. And there's almost that thing of when you get the acknowledgement from the elders, the people yeah. that you looked up to, it's yeah. almost bigger than getting it from the audiences that you don't know. <laughs> come on. It's, it's you know, they're, they're, they're not sitting down, looking out and watching you all the time. But yeah. you've done something that, like, I remember when Stevie Wonder done, um, 
he did a, he did a single, right? Um, no New Year's Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dun, I, dun, just, dun, dun. I, I just, just called to say I love you. Right. And my mom heard it and just fell in love with it. And I hated that song. I told him <laughs> that song for me was, I wasn't feeling that song. And he started <laughs> laughing and he said to me, yeah, but like 10 million people do, Junior. And I'm like, I get you. Yeah, I get yeah, you. Exactly. He you does, know? Stevie Wonder. And again, you, know? you realize, you see, so many inspirational guy things this guy says without even knowing it. You have to realize that there's a whole big world out there. Exactly. More than your community. Exactly. And though you never, you know, you never turn your back on your community, which you have no. never done. We will get mm. to that later. <laughs> You've never done. But, you know, because the people in your immediate circle don't get something, it doesn't mean that the people out there won't get it. Well, and get that, it. You know, that's yeah. what it's about. It's more than just your community of people. When you're, you're doing showing off your people, you're, yeah. you're a part of your community, you're a exactly. part of that. You know, you're, and, you're doing something that is, you know, that should appeal to more than just your community. Exactly. And I think that's a mistake people make. You're like, well, my, my brethren, he don't like it, or my, my sister don't like it. So it's rubbish, man. No, but you know, well, just cross the road. Maybe somebody, maybe on somebody the over there the road like that you exactly. don't know might love it. Exactly. You know? It was that whole thing of, of you can do this, Junior, in the way that you want to. You don't have to follow. Morning Will Come did that. Lots of people wanted to do Morning Will Come, that kind of vibe, but found that it was like, can't really recreate this in a way but works in the same way as the yeah, original very again a very special and individual sound that has yeah. lasted to now and you even remixed it as a jungle version yeah we had fun <laughs> <laughs> we had fun i i um when jungle was just beginning as a music form here i went to the birmingham carnival and everything up there was jungle. They would take Sweet Love. They would take a, yes. an Art Kelly song. They would, you know, um, Big, Broad and Heavy, right? Mad you know? Yeah, Bitches, Mademoiselle. Yeah, Fox exactly. is Mademoiselle. Yeah. Right. So they did, I was up there and I'm listening to all of this stuff and these kids are going crazy up there, you know? Big, Broad and Heavy. And it, yeah, it was yeah. Crazy was so fast it was like a I don't know a hundred and whatever beats it was but it was incredibly fast so they sweet love and all of that they'd, they'd sample it and they'd run it and it would be really fast you know because they're running yeah, in time yeah. so then when Wicked came out and General Levy put out Wicked with an MB Wicked Wicked Jungle is massive Wicked, <laughs> wicked. I love Look at it. a free concert here, guys. Do you see this? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked came out and I got a phone call from MB saying that like he really loved Morning Will Come and he's done something for it. Was I interested in getting together? So I thought, of course. So when we got together, I listened to the track, but I couldn't figure out at first, how am I going to sing this? Right? Because it was so fast. But I'd worked with Phil Linnett prior to working with him. And when I worked with Phil, the whole rock thing was 100 miles an hour. But Phil used to sing half time. Yeah. So he, was, he taught me that when you get those kind of beats that are like running real fast, you sing half time. Yeah. So going in. In between. And, not exactly. Every note, every, in between. Yeah. You, you flow on it, but you're half timing it. So what you're actually doing by doing that is your voice is slowing the track down. It's, it's still doing what it's doing, but your voice is slowing the track down and putting it into a place where people who couldn't get that 100 miles an hour could get the melody. Yeah. So 